Maria and Laramie, thank you so much for joining me on Louisiana Lefty. I've invited y'all on today because y'all are both with Decarcerate Louisiana and you were involved with the Constitutional Amendment 7, the push to pass that. And I really wanted to get some information directly from y'all because there was so much conflicting information on that amendment. And I feel like voters wanted to vote the right way, but didn't know what that meant. So I really just wanted to get your story and have y'all give us feedback on, and I can ask you this a, a little more in detail later, but I want to know what happened, but I also would like to get your opinion after y'all tell us that story. I'd like to find out what we can do better next time is really where I'd like to go. So whoever would like to start, please uh, introduce yourself and then Give, give us some feedback on Constitutional Amendment 7. Yeah, sure. So my name is Maria Harmon. Um, I serve as president of the board for Decarcerate Louisiana. And I'm also one of the co-directors for Step Up Louisiana. Of course, we partnered with Decarcerate um, on the Yes on 7 coalition. And uh, essentially, Amendment 7 was uh, developed to abolish the slavery exception clause out of our state's constitution. And um, this is also a strategy that is taking place in many other states across the country, because this is all in efforts to uh, nullify the 13th Amendment to place another amendment in its place that completely eliminates slavery and involuntary servitude with no exception. Um, and, and that's essentially what uh, this uh, whole movement is about. We understand the uh, implications that many of incarcerated people face uh, because of that exception clause due to inhumane uh, conditions to live in, uh, inhumane uh, circumstances and how they're treated, not really having their personhood respected, not having their labor respected either in a, a very systemic uh, in, in volatile and oppressive structure that we call the incarceration system here in Louisiana. And it was very imperative that we uh, made some strides this year, but unfortunately we were met with a lot of opposition that had a lot of resources and a lot of influence that caused for a lot of confusion to, to take place. And um, it's just unfortunate that the intentions that were initially set um, were not uh, fully impacted um, in the masses across the, uh, the state. But uh, a lot of people have learned some things come out, coming out of this situation and I'm hopeful for the future because we're not giving up. Yes, um, my name is Laramie Griffin. I am the vice president of the board for the Cost Rate Louisiana. And I'm also the founder of Evolve Louisiana. Um, we started this journey um, as coming together as a, uh, a group that formed the Cross Red Louisiana officially um, two years ago, um, around summer, between summer and fall, to get this, uh, this abolition amendment um, pushed through legislation to fully abolish slavery and involuntary servitude as punishment for crime. Um, and the mission of the Cross Red Louisiana is, it has a, the task of the mission to uh, fully prohibit slavery and voluntary servitude, human trafficking uh, throughout the state of Louisiana. Uh, that is the full mission. That is the national mission. Uh, and some people who do not know that this is a push to fully uh, to repeal the 13th Amendment. Uh, we can't abolish um, we can't abolish the uh, 13th Amendment because it is, it is a living document. So when we get three quarters of the states to abolish slavery and involuntary servitude as far as in their constitutions, then we can repeal the 13th Amendment, which will then enact, we have to start another amendment, which will say slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, period. And um, so uh, working together with the cost rate and the national organization, the Abolish Slavery National Network has been uh, definitely mind blowing as far as uh, their knowledge and our knowledge coming together as far as what's in our state laws, our constitution and our revised statutes and the differences, the few differences between the states, but most of the states have the same exact mirrored 
amendment which says slavery and voluntary servitude are prohibited except that exception as punishment for crime has continued slavery in a legalized way um, which has put people in very traumatizing positions, deadly positions, uh, positions of you know, mass incarceration, uh, position of uh, wrongful treatment, wrongful prosecution, and so on and so forth. So this is not, this wasn't just a one for all. This was going to be, like Maria said, just, uh, just bringing back people's citizenship as an actual person of being treated humanely and not being treated as just someone who's subhuman. That's not what we want. Uh, we want people to be treated as they were born. We, uh, we definitely want, let's say someone has um, sleep apnea that's incarcerated. We want them to, re to, uh, to receive a, uh, be able to sleep with a CPAP machine. But right now it's considered contraband. So we need that separation. You know, people are not, uh, people don't need to be treated as in such a way because people have families, they have still have loved ones, they still have children. And so we want that for everyone. But this has been uh, also not the treatment, but also been a monopoly for a lot of organ, uh, a lot of uh, businesses, you know, across the country um, in the hundreds, and they make millions and billions off of us, uh, off those people every year without it actually coming back to the community, without coming back as far as uh, help, as far as what they were incarcerated for in the first place. So, um, like I said, that's what this is about. Uh, we want people to understand that this is not going to just free everyone and open up the floodgates to the jails and prisons. This is about making sure everyone has uh, citizenship like they're supposed to, like the Constitution says it's supposed to. But with this exception, it puts them in a different category. And we want to remove it and bring people uh, back to a place like everyone else, a positive place to where they can live free to where they can have uh, the have the basic needs the, the basic necessities as far as living life i think what was missing in some of the coverage of this amendment is that it is this movement that you're talking about where there were a, like i didn't hear the news stories about this being on the ballot in what was it five states total four, four other states five total yes I didn't hear that until after it failed. Yeah. So that, that was never part of the news coverage. The only news coverage I saw was about the legislate legislator who carried the bill through the legislature, then saying, I don't want people to vote yes on it. So that to me feels like a media didn't really give this fair coverage. Does, do y'all have that sense about it or am I off base there? No, I would have to agree. Yeah, yeah. I would have to agree. Um, yeah. And also the local media, once they're approached by certain people in power about taking a certain position on some things, um, th that's essentially where the attention went towards. Right. And and like I said, she is exactly right. Um, we contacted the local news to try to get our side of the story because they took one side. Um, we've actually had different interviews and they've turn it into to a person, they, they took the side of a person who had a title and that's what they had here. Um, local news, that's what they done to us. But nationally, they were over, I believe, 40 articles within, I believe, a month that came out nationally. But locally, they weren't taking the side of uh, how big this was and uh, the right step as far as who is saying what and why they're saying what they are saying. So three quarters of the states need to pass this kind of amendment in order for the U.S. government to take it up for a, for a federal constitutional amendment. Is that right? Yes, it will help to expedite the process for sure. And the Abolish Slavery National Network, which is uh, the national group leading on this effort and is also a supporter of Decarcerate Louisiana, um, they have already identified a couple of federal legislators, uh, Senator Bernie Sanders being one of them, to put the legislation in place through uh, the U.S. Congress and U.S. Senate um, to make a 28th Amendment. And how far away are y'all from having three quarters of the states? 
Well, so far, I believe there's about eight total now, eight states total who have uh, passed uh, constitutional amendments to uh, amend their uh, state constitution that strips away the exception clause. Right. <clears throat> and um, there are going to be, and I want to add to that, um, there are going to be another 20, uh, a, a push for another 20 on the ballot next year. And so that will push us to a possible 28. So we're looking at about 38 states that we do need that will help us push to not abolish um, the 13th Amendment, it will repeal, which will create, like Maria said, it will create the 28th Amendment, which will say slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, period. Okay. And Omari, when I spoke to her, had mentioned that y'all took this to our legislature in 2021 also, and it didn't get out of committee. What was the difference this year with getting it out of committee? I would say... Um... I, I believe there was more collaboration amongst legislators as far as working together to reach a compromise in the language of the bill. Um, in the first year, there was some very strong opposition right out the gate. Uh, Representative Alan Seaball even said that was the most dangerous piece of legislation that came before them in 2021. And then when we came back again with the same bill, um, Representative Richard Nelson offered up uh, the amendment that Utah actually utilized to repeal their slavery exception clause in their state constitution. And the language literally mirrored each other. So there wasn't uh, too much of a difference between the language. Unfortunately, I feel like what was the downside to us being successful with Amendment 7 was the actual ballot question. Because the ballot question did not actually reflect the actual language of the bill itself, Act 246. How do you, how do you mean? Well, the question uh, asks if you uh, are in favor of uh, involuntary servitude and slavery being prohibited except for any otherwise lawful administration of criminal justice. And that was a uh, completely different language. And when you put except in there, it actually changes up the intent and the concept of the law. When really uh, in the first paragraph um, it, in article one, section three, it says involuntary servitude and slavery are prohibited, except for the latter case of crime has been scratched out. And all you see is period at the end, there's no except. And then it goes into the subparagraph does not apply to the otherwise lawful administration of criminal justice. And that was actually the amendment that Representative Nelson offered up because everyone uh, who was in that discussion in civil law and procedure, they understood the, what the context of administration of criminal justice meant in Louisiana, which pretty much alludes to hard labor or forced labor. So what we did not want to do was implicate um, working opportunities that are already in place for incarcerated people being work and release programs and actual jobs that are afforded. And in that also in that situation, being that slavery and involuntary, it, slavery and involuntary servitude are uh, abolished and prohibited with no exception, that actually opens up the ambiguity of criminal justice, uh, administration of criminal justice in Louisiana because the personhood of incarcerated people has been intact. So now they can actually argue in court. They have a chance now before they couldn't even file a lawsuit about this. But now if we would have passed it, it would have given us the first step we needed to give incarcerated people a chance to actually challenge the Department of Corrections to pay them for a full wage for their labor um, and, and not have a, uh, crazy amounts of money extracted out of their check as well for work release uh, programs for incarcerated people. Right now, none of that is being impacted. It's remaining as is because we voted that amendment down. Right. And then when I mentioned something about the Utah language on Twitter, and I obviously am not anywhere near as informed on this as you, so I didn't want to get super into it. That someone pushed back on that saying, well, you know, laws in Louisiana are different. So you can't just take the language from Utah and put it in Louisiana and expect it to work the same. Do y'all have any thoughts on that? Yes. Um, 
as, as that person was right. No laws in any state are the same, but they're very similar. Um, the, the one thing about um, Louisiana law as far as inside of criminal justice is revised statute uh, 15 184 825C, which says that in Louisiana, uh, a person can't be sentenced to hard labor de depending on their conviction. Now, what this was going to do, it was going to change the definition of hard labor. As you can see, the wording is very, very important. So that means anything lined up with slavery and involuntary servitude have to now be prohibited. It will be considered unlawful uh, in every sense of the matter, as Maria said about not getting the proper pay, making people uh, making people work against their will, um, not getting proper medical care, access to uh, access to their families, and so on and so forth. So that's what this was about. It would have made those type of things unlawful and hard labor would change. Um, as you know, if you're convicted of a felony, that you're convicted of hard labor. If you're convicted of a misdemeanor, uh, you're not convicted to hard labor, which, which changes uh, the workage as far as the work and the type of work you do and if you are compensated or not. Um, but like I said, this is about the inhumane treatment about human trafficking and and just the monopolizing off of human bodies on a daily basis. Um, and in the revised statutes, there is a, a section that talks about how much each person, how much the uh, the prisons make per person per day, which is twenty four dollars and fifty cents. It's actually there, so people have to know what the Louisiana revised statute was mean. Um, another uh, piece of disinformation was, or misinformation was that it will put a limit on involuntary servitude. The bill uh, clearly says slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, period. That is it. And the subparagraph, like Maria said, all that means is that uh, the the work will not the work release programs will not stop, which actually helps people. But now the definition of what that work is is going to change because now slavery and involuntary servitude are prohibited, and people try to uh, say that involuntary servitude was different from slavery. They're very very similar and the same. But if someone challenges you on that, and they've challenged us, if you look up in the Black's Law Dictionary, which is the law of the land for for almost all of law. It's when you look up the word involuntary servitude, it has the word slavery right next to it. And so that's what we had. We had a, not a rebuttal because the rebuttal is more. We had a pure fact of what everything meant, what the subparagraph meant, uh, and the actual mission of the carcerate and the national network. So that's why we asked people to vote yes on seven. And now, since it has gone the other way, we have to go back again to move in that same direction. But now we're in a moment of place of teaching and now people are paying attention. And so mm -hmm. that's where we are. We are a teaching organization. What we know, the people know. Who is against this? And you mentioned that prisons get paid per, is it bed they fill? Is that the $24 a day? Is that is that who might be against this? being passed um, um the person who was against it um was the bill sponsor we really don't uh, understand why um we didn't uh we didn't have good communication after the bill passed and maybe he received counsel from someone else but um we know that with the sub paragraph it made a it made the um people who were for criminal justice that that this was that the work was not going to stop that's what they are pretty much afraid of and this sub paragraph that's all it said that work was not going to stop the programs were going, were going to continue and all we wanted was uh uh the people's personhood to come back to them and not be treated as subhuman and that's part of that greater movement of trying to repeal yeah. the 13th which right. i think is also needs to be made clear but I mean, besides this year, who would be against this? Is it the folks who ha who have private prisons who rely on that labor, or or am I? I believe so. 
Yeah, yeah the people who benefit monetarily from this for sure mm-hmm. your uh your mega corporations who benefit from prison labor uh could be very well against this because they would have to um actually pay people um their full wage at this point um also there might be some uh leaders that uh you know, wardens or whatnot who lead different prisons or for-profit prisons who may uh, get a cut of whatever earnings are made off of uh, prison labor in in partnership with some other corporation that's contracting with that prison for labor. Um, These these people who uh, may have to actually be impacted by workers or incarcerated people who are working um, to be paid their full wage, I could see them giving some opposition. And it did not pass in 2021. It did pass, if I understood Omari correctly, unanimously it passed? Yes, we had so many legislators sign on. And that was the confusing piece to many of the leaders who were part of the Yes on 7 coalition, because many of the legislators signed on after the amendment was made into the law. And uh, because the law was, once it was signed, I mean, it, it, the amendment happened on the, uh, during the discourse um, in the hearing session for a civil law and procedure. So once it matriculated out of there, that's when it went to the floor. That's when all these co-authors came on in the House side. And then right. it went over to the Senate side and then more co-authors on the Senate side signed on. So I, that's where a lot of the confusion came in, you know? Right. And yeah. also um, there yeah. was to Laramie's mm-hmm. point where there was a disconnect between the sponsor and our advocacy group was the fact that we were in constant communication with him. He even came to a celebratory event with us in June. You know, we shared that video of him saying that he was happy about how things happened. And, you know, uh, we, we saw a victory and went for it in that direction. And the next mm-hmm. step is having the question on the ballot, you know, so what, four to eight weeks after that to see all of a sudden, and we told him, hey, we're going to have to uh, edit this question because we're going to have to challenge the legislature on this because the ballot question does not reflect the language of the actual law. And there was like no follow-up from that. The next thing we saw was a quote from him in an article from the business report. And that really set the tone for how we proceeded forward uh, leading up to November 8th. Did you and, have uh, something to add to that, Laramie? Yeah, it was actually uh, 29 uh, co-sponsors. And we have to, dis- we have to uh, separate the definition from, co- from authors and sponsors because the Abolished Slavery National Network and the Carcer in Louisiana were the authors and Representative Edmund Jordan was the sponsor because you need an actual uh, a sitting representative to actually sign on to push it through. But yes, there was a there was a disconnect after it passed, um, and because it was a constitutional amendment, uh, the governor could not veto it because it was voted through the actual legislator. So once he signed it, it was actually going to be put up to vote. It was just a time of them going through the process, turning it into an act, and then actually coming on the ballot, which became Amendment Number Seven. So. What is your concern then since this has failed in 2021 and now you've got to go back to the drawing board in 2023, do you have some concern that you'll have difficulty passing it through the legislature next year? I feel like we're going to have opposition again like we did this year. Um, But I'm more hopeful because um, we can take a bipartisan approach in a collaborative effort of legislators, uh, more than one actually spearheading this effort where they can actually see diversity in the leadership, um, not only along party lines, but ideological uh, aspects as well. Cause I think uh, this will give us more advantage. Um, The only concern we have though, is this being a fiscal session. There's a few limitations of how many bills different legislators can hold and really what is at the the top of the priority list. Because unfortunately this wasn't uh, at the top of everyone's priority list at the top of this year. And we're starting to see the impacts of that. So hopefully everybody who can be influential and impactful are all on the same page about this effort come next year. Are y'all talking to a legislature, a legislator about bringing this? 
next yes, year? Yes, we are. We, we, we have a couple of legislators we have in mind to reach out to. Yeah. Okay. And is there opportunity for there to be, you know, we've seen unanimous juries, a couple of big criminal justice reforms, things pass in this state. Is there an opportunity to get a big movement like that together, the criminal justice reform groups? kind of working together right. so that so this is there's a lot more messaging and a lot more push for this yeah at first right. there was much hesitation mm -hmm. for everyone to seamlessly come together at the very beginning because of the ballot the language and the ballot question but um being that a lot of lessons were learned coming out of this situation and um there's much more clarity that's being set for everyone about um what is the best strategy to take or the best approach to actually see this through I'm more hopeful about more criminal justice groups coming on board with us. Laramie, did you have more? Um, yes, and this uh, we do believe will be a win and it would have been a win for anyone dealing with human rights, anyone dealing with criminal justice reform, prison reform, or just the loved ones of the ones who who, who deal with this on a daily basis as far as being incarcerated. This is a win for everyone. This is not about the cost rate, this is about uh, people throughout the United States benefiting from removing um, this, this, very, this very ugly piece of uh, language that has been sitting, but well, sitting in Louisiana for the last 157 years. Um, so we want to make sure that everyone has a chance to come to the table and we move this forward um, yet again. Um, like you said, with with hopefully no pushback that everyone could be happy, say, look, we need to remove this. This is Louisiana. We are very different, but we also are very powerful in uh, starting and finishing a lot of things. So let's go ahead and finish. Let's finish this strong. Let's get it out of here. Let's move forward to the uh, to the federal amendment. Next. And what do we as advocates or general voters in Louisiana need to do better next time? What can we do better? Um, I would just say just be in tune uh, and up to date with the traction of the bill. Like we'll let everyone know once that bill is filed, what that bill number will be. And just your support in engaging the legislature to see how important this is for us to really make a historic move like this as a, as a state um, to help with our contribution for another historic move to happen in the country. Well, I want to make sure my story that I've come away with this is, is that maybe we don't necessarily always need to listen to, as you said, someone with a title, the elected leaders. I'm not trying to say anything negative about our elected leaders. I'm just saying, I believe our community groups really maybe sometimes have the best message for us. And if we're listening to them, we might come away more informed. So I wanna make sure like wherever I post this video, wherever I share it, I'd like to be able to share ways for people to connect to y'all so they can get more information in the, in the future and feel like they have a way to be better informed. Cause I certainly know a lot of people walked away going, I, I did not wanna vote to keep slavery in our constitution. That's not what I wanted to vote for. And I feel like some people felt bad on the other side of it that they didn't feel like they were fully informed. Correct. I, yeah. Yep. I agree you, with that. Y'all have yeah. any closing thoughts you want to end with? Go ahead, Laramie. Yeah, and we and we do believe that. We believe that um, if the misinformation was not put out and we when we had a chance to not be, I say, shadowed locally, most people, we do believe that besides the 508,000 that voted yes on seven, the other, the other 798,000, we do believe most of them would have said, if vote yes on seven means to end slavery, that's what I want to do. I don't know what it means. I don't know where it's going. I'll find out and let's move in that direction. But people were met with different pieces of information, um, different sample ballots um, that came out through their mail and we don't fault them for following what you know, people who are next to them or who people who represented them told them to do. But we do believe that in the hearts of people in Louisiana, that we believe over 85%, especially people who are not benefiting, want to 
in slavery as they've done in four other states this past year. So we do believe in the people. We know the people have great hearts here. We live here, our lineage is here. So we just definitely want to move forward and keep going and focus on the positive messaging and the actual education of what ending slavery means in Louisiana and the United States. Anything else, Maria? Um, I would just say uh, the fight for liberation and justice continues. We'll be back on the ground, you know, advocating for another piece of legislation to be filed uh, for this upcoming legislative session. And we're just hopeful. We, we, we're just asking for those groups who are already on board with us, stay with us in the fight for anyone else who wants to come and join us and add value to what we're doing. We welcome you. And uh, we just encourage more people who want to be willing to learn. We're willing to teach. So, <laughs> so thank you for having us. Absolutely. Thank y'all so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom. And I think to both y'all's points, really, if folks are engaged with this when it's in the legislative process, they'll know how to vote on the other side when it comes on their ballot. So maybe we can get people more engaged during legislative session next year. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.